I'm so excited this morning to see many of you who have been a blessing to me and my family for the last uh, many, many, many years, I would say, and those who continue to love us and support us and pray for us and encourage us. So I'm in the company of good friends, and that gives me great liberty and freedom this morning to proclaim the Word of God. You know, from my boyhood, I have been deeply impressed, and uh, uh, this has made an indelible impression upon my heart, the love and relationship between God's people. My father came from a Jacobite background, and my mother hailed from a Marthamite background. But over the last many, many years, the love and fellowship and the hospitality we have enjoyed among the people of God through the families of brothers and sisters that have made a deep and indelible impression upon my own life and in the life of my children, in the life of my wife, and we praise the Lord for that. There is some mystery behind it. It is the love of God which we can never get through any other means other than through the blood relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we praise the Lord together this morning for our blessed Savior. As you know, I have completed 36 years of ministry when I was a young man during my final year. In college, the Lord called me and separated me for his ministry, did not allow me to enter into any secular field. That was his divine plan and purpose. Most of the time, the Lord allows people to go to a secular vocation, and from there, the Lord calls them and separates them. Sometimes that secular experience is also good and valuable, that teaches valuable and wonderful lessons of life. But in my case, it was an exception, and the Lord uh, called me as a young man during my final year college. Now, when I look back, I praise the Lord for all the various ways through which the Lord has led me and blessed me and enriched my life and my ministry. Uh, for the last probably 10 or 12 years, I'm more involved in global missions, as you know especially the ministry in Africa and India, Eastern Europe, and in other parts of the world. And it was a great joy for me to partner with uh, uh, Vinoji and his family, and also Jacob Verghese in Kenya, and also numerous others, uh, uh, African brothers and sisters uh, in the great continent of uh, Africa, and also in different parts of the world. You know, I wanted the extra time just to share a very exciting experience that happened recently. Uh, in the month of April, I was in Nigeria, probably the most uh, 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 fearful part of the world today. It's a very uh, difficult part, and it is uh, really a risk to go there. Uh, when we went in April, uh, I did not sense the risk uh, as I sense it today now, but several bad and things were happening there, terrorist activities and uh, dangerous things, but the Lord amazingly protected us. And in the great conference there, there were 3,000 believers. Our assemblies there are known as Assemblies of the Lord's Called Ones. That is the name of the brethren assemblies there. Assemblies of the Lord's Called Ones Conference, 3,000 people. That was exciting and other evangelistic opportunity. But the unique opportunity was the Amaze Ministry, the Amaze Correspondence Course, and the teaching of the Word of God through Amaze Ministry that is going on there, coordinated by Brother Jim Gillette. And I have never seen the power of God, power of God's Word in my life as I have seen it recently. The power of God's word to change people, to sanctify people, to deliver people in the hospitals, in the post offices, and in the prisons, and in the schools, in the police stations, and in the government offices of Nigeria. 
people coming together and studying the MA's courses initiated and started by the brethren. And uh, it is a tremendous blessing to that country, not only for the assemblies, but cross-denominationally. The next thing what I'm going to share is even more exciting, that unique experience. 100 people came and stayed with us for a week and studied the word of God. And 60 of them were from known assembly backgrounds. Some of them were police inspectors, some of them were postmaster generals, some of them were military colonels and captains, some of them were nurses, some of them were teachers, some of them were farmers, some of them owned business. They all have studied the MA's course, and they are all correctors now, or leaders now, who are certified to teach others. So we invited them to come and meet with us, and to stay with us, to eat with us, to talk with us, to enjoy fellowship with us, and also to listen to our teaching. Cross-denominationally, some of them come from charismatic background, which is, uh, you know, very influential in the tribal regions uh, all over Africa. They all came and studied, asked numerous questions so that uh, they may be able to understand the deeper things of God's word. And we recharged their batteries, prayed with them, and uh, empowered them, and gave them wonderful lessons from God's word. And on that Sunday morning, we had the Lord's Supper meeting, some of them seeing a New Testament pattern of worship, you know, gathering unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, worshiping as priests before God. And that was such an enjoyable, exciting experience for them and also for us and especially for me because usually I'm in the company of the brethren even though preach the gospel uh, uh, before others, but this was a company of the brethren and known brethren, and they all coming together. And I am inundated by emails from Nigeria, and uh, I have to spend a lot of time now in answering their questions. They continue the follow-up work. You know, one dear brother who is the postmaster general of a district, a very educated man. And uh, he sends me an email almost every week. He begins like, Calvary greetings, my brother, Calvary greetings. And uh, this is the question I got from one of my friends who is studying the MA's course with me. Would you help me to answer that? So recently I told my wife I need to appoint a secretary and we need to pay that person because I cannot handle all this now. So global outreach uh, in the gospel and the Lord is doing great things and I know that you all are involved in the work of the Lord one way or the other, even though you may not be going to Nigeria or Kenya or Malawi, but I am sure that you all are helping each one of us to make things happen for God's glory. Isn't it a wonderful thought that you are making things happen? That would impact the kingdom of God and the lives of people and in the global outreach of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in addition to the humble ministries, I'm involved here in the United States. Uh, I will be going again to Kenya first week of uh, uh, August and uh, uh, four or five dear brothers and sisters are coming with me this time just to observe what is happening there, and also to observe me, what I'm doing, you know. So they are coming, and some of them are even in this group. So pray that we may have a very wonderful, edifying, and a profitable and a blessed time uh, in that uh, mission field. Uh, uh, India and Africa have great priority for me in my travels and ministry, so uh, uh, I give a great priority for these two uh, countries and, uh, all, of course, in other places also as the Lord uh, uh, opens the ways and uh, gives me opportunity. So 
I would definitely appreciate your ministry. I know that you all are praying. Some of you may not know all the details, and I don't want to take more time to tell you more details, but uh, uh, this was a very exciting thing that recently happened uh, in my life uh, in the Africa mission. So continue to pray that the Lord may uh, use me mightily uh, in the days to come uh, for his glory, and thank you very much. Texas Army, shall I say, a big Texan, thank you. Eh? That is the way to put it. Praise God. You know, we have been enjoying the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our theme, though it was shepherding, through the various aspects of shepherding, we were beholding the glory of our shepherd. And that is the thought that came to me this morning, that I need to speak more of the glories of our shepherd. Uh, we were talking about the responsibilities of elders, family shepherding, shepherding in his evangelism and ministry in, uh, among children, uh, all those various aspects of uh, shepherding. What are some of the practical guidelines, the different methodologies, the transformational changes we need to make in the assemblies? All these things are valid and important. But at the same time, through it all, our attention is being repeatedly called by the Holy Spirit to look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our salvation. He is our shepherd, our good shepherd and great shepherd and our chief shepherd. Without looking at the shepherd, without enjoying him, without being attached to him in a deep relationship, we cannot do shepherding in any way. The deep appreciation for our shepherd is the energizing factor in our shepherding ministry. You know, last evening, Brother Sam presented the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the ultimate question in the gospel is, what do you think of the Lord Jesus Christ? That is a question that will determine your eternal destiny. The answer to that question is going to determine the eternal destiny of every human being. Let me add something to it. What do you think of Jesus Christ also determines the quality of your ministry, the quality of your Christian life, the quality of your eldership, the quality of your family life, the quality of the, your entire Christian life? Because... If we do not really love the Lord and do not hold him as preeminent and supreme in our life, that will have an adverse effect upon all what we do as believers. So what do we think of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's not only a question in relation to the gospel. It is a question in relation to discipleship and Christian life also. It will determine the quality, the sanctity, the purity, the dignity, and the nobility, and the solemnity of your life and ministry. Secular life and all what you do for the Lord. So let us make sure that we have a deep appreciation for our Lord Jesus Christ. So by way of introduction, you don't have to turn to these verses now. By way of introduction, a thought occurred to me this morning when I got up very early in the morning. And that is what I want to share by way of introduction to Jesus Christ as our good and great and chief shepherd. In the book of Acts, this is just an introduction. In the book of Acts, we have three records of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, that is Apostle Paul. Three times the Holy Spirit has recorded or repeated the conversion story of Saul of Tarsus. In hermeneutics, repetition is to call our attention. That's a very important hermeneutical principle, a principle of Bible interpretation. When something is repeated, the Spirit of God is calling our special attention to it. In Acts chapter 9, Dr. Luke 
by way of history records the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And as he was approaching the city of Damascus near the gate, this is what we read. Suddenly, a light shone around him from heaven. Okay? Suddenly, a light that is kind of the Shekinah glory of God, the dazzling splendor of the majestic presence of Jesus of Nazareth shone around him, if I interpret that rightly. The, that light shone, I believe, was the Shekinah glory of the very presence of the resurrected, ascended, glorified Christ arresting this great intellectual giant and calling his attention. That is Dr. Luke's version. In Acts chapter 22, Paul himself gives his testimony. You know, he modified Dr. Luke's statement slightly. You know what he said? A great light from heaven shone around me. He modified it a little bit. A great light. Luke, you were right, because Luke also wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the Paul, Paul, when he wrote, when he said that, he said it was a great light. Then in chapter 26, before the, I believe it was before King Agrippa, Paul got a third chance, an opportunity to share his testimony. Then he modified it further. You know what he said? I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me. So as you recall that event, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ became greater and greater in his review and in his reflection. So as we conclude this conference, Solomon said 3,000 years ago, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. As we conclude it, the final moments of this conference, let us have a greater appreciation for the glory of our Savior. Let us review from all what happened from Wednesday. You know, light from heaven, great light from heaven. Now let us say, a bright, that light of the glory of his love and his grace and forgiveness and his shepherding care. Oh, Lord Jesus, it is greater and wonderful and brighter than the sun. Then he asked, the, the Lord asked the question, who are you? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And Paul was converted. Then he asked him another question, what shall I do, Lord? So as we appreciate our Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I believe all of us have asked the, asked the first question, answered the first question. Let us ask the second question, what shall I do? You are the good shepherd. You gave your life for me. You are the great shepherd. You leads me every day and provides for me. You are the chief shepherd and I'm looking for that blessed hope when you will come back and take me home and wipe my tears and I will be with you forever. Lord, until that day, you have not called me yet. You have still given me health and wealth and blessing and family and, uh, you know, a great life in the most blessed country on earth. But what shall I do for you? What shall I do as a result of coming to this conference and enjoying you and knowing you as my great and good and chief shepherd? Lord, I want to do something for you, for your glory, not for my glory, not for my name and fame. I want to do something for you. Let me connect this with what he wrote in the epistles. And I, the Lord showed me this morning, this is very much related to what we have been considering. 
about biblical shepherdology and about the Lord Jesus Christ, our great, good, and chief shepherd. That is why I'm taking the time to share it, even though it is an introduction. This is the, you know, this builds in very well to the core of our theme. In the epistles, when Paul, as he appreciated the greatness and the glories of Christ, he became smaller and smaller. Paul means little. But he became, you know, even humbler and smaller. In 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I am least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle. But we consider him as the greatest of all the apostles. No doubt about it. Yesterday, somebody was telling that, you know, even in the eyes of the world, he is one of the great six men who walked upon planet Earth. But he said, I am least of the apostles not worthy to be called. But if anybody is worthy to be called an apostle, he is. In his education, in his intellectual capacity, in his Pharisaic zeal, in his commitment, in his religiosity, he is the one. But he said, I am not worthy. He wrote that in 1 Corinthians 15, written around probably 50 or 50, 51 or 52. Then after AD 51 or 52, then 10 years later, he wrote Ephesians. In that chapter 3, he wrote, I am less than the least of all saints. I am less than least of all the saints. Greater glory, greater glory, greater glory. And the man started singing and dwindled into insignificance. I think that is the lesson we need to take. We have been thinking about our shepherd, the great, good, and the chief shepherd. We are going to consider little more about him. But whether we consider anything more about him is not really important to me this morning. We have considered enough. And through the lens of Paul's eye, by way of confession, let us apply these truths into our life. Lord, there is a great need that myself has to die. All the problems which I face, probably our assemblies face, our ministries face, all the unhappiness, divisiveness is because, Lord, I have no clue about this truth. And right deep into my heart, this truth that I may behold thy glory, and as a result of that, I may shrink and shrink. He must increase, I must decrease. Another great prophet. One more thing. After writing probably Ephesians, after writing Ephesians, two years later, almost towards the end of his life, he wrote, First Timothy, he became very, very mature, walking with the Lord, loving the Lord, seeing the glory of the Lord. And that wonderful reflection of the glory of the Lord that arrested him at the gate of Damascus, he could not get over it. Then towards the end of his life in First Timothy, he wrote, Christ Jesus, this is a trustworthy statement and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And I am chief of all sinners. I am least of all the apostles. I am least of all the saints. And the maturest apostle, the greatest one, the apostle of the apostles. Apart from Jesus Christ, the world calls him as the founder of Christianity. Paul, he said, I am the chief of 
all sinners. What humility. What glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. The shepherds are nothing. We as under shepherds, we are nothing. I emphasize quite a bit about our skillfulness and ability and the leadership capacity. I like those things. I, need, I know our assemblies need it. And I very forcefully presented it to you. And you were very patient with me. But brothers and sisters, even if you forget all that, that is all right. You can. You can forget it. But don't forget this. That our Savior, whom we were worshipping this morning, we were declaring his glory. The glory of his humiliation. The glory of his condescension. The glory of his cross. The glory of his incarnation. The glory of his resurrection. The glory of his exaltation. The glory of his ascension. The glory of his high priestly ministry today. And in his imperial royal majestic glory. He is going to come back as our chief shepherd. Don't forget that. Forget everything what Alexander Korean said. Even if you forget it, it's all right. But don't forget this. As we appreciate him more, we will start saying, I am least of all the leaders. I am least of all the elders. Even though I am the most gifted man, even though I am the most educated man, even though I am the most ablest leader among the brethren community, I will learn to say, I am least of you. I want to serve you. I want to wash your feet. I am least of all the saints. I am least of all the believers. Look at all the young people, our children, those who have believed on the Lord, gathered together this morning. Let me say to you, my dear brothers and sisters, young people, I am least of all than all of you. And then let me confess that I am the chief of all sinners. I am here only by his grace, only by the power of the blood of Christ. Let us see the glory of our Savior, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. Let us give our lives to him, our money to him, our wealth to him, our intelligence our wealth and our education, our ability. He is the only one who deserves it. The corporations of the world, heck with it, they don't deserve it. You know, we go there to make some living, that is okay as long as the Lord wants it. But let us not give our best to them. Let us not allow the world to squeeze us into its mold. We may have to be breadwinners, we have to work hard, I know. As I have told you, that the man should support the family, but in our family, you know, the Lord has given us an exception. Wrong theology, don't practice it. But it, the Lord makes exceptions sometimes, you know, but not for everyone. It is a very special case of exception. So sometimes, you know, he sovereignly does things. So as long as he wants us to do those things, let us do it. But let us remember this truth that let us give our best to him. And for little time, you know, very little time only, I want to draw your attention to John's Gospel, chapter 10, looking at our Lord Jesus Christ as our good shepherd. These are very simple tr truths. All of us know it. I just want to put that in the right perspective, that is all, in the right order so that it may help our understanding, our interpretation, and it will help us to memorize it. John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. What does the good shepherd do? Good in the sense of genuine, true, excellent, winsome, lovely. No one like him. Probably, if we connect what happened in chapter 9, the religious leaders of Judaism, 
If you read chapter 9, you will get this impression. The Pharisees, you know, and probably the Lord is contrasting himself with them. They are not the true leaders. They are not the real gurus. They are not the true shepherds. But I am the one. I am the true shepherd. If you want to see somebody who is genuine, somebody who is really true, and one who is the truth, one who is lovely, fairer than everyone, I am the one. And I'm not claiming that I am the best one. I have done the best thing I can do for you. I have given my life. The good shepherd loves the sheep, seeks the sheep, searches for the sheep. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. The lost sheep is lost through ignorance. And the lost coin is lost to use. And the lost son is lost through willful rebellion. And that is how we were lost. That is how people are lost today. Some are lost through ignorance, some are lost to use, and some are lost through willful rebellion. But what does the good shepherd, what does he do? He will leave the 99 sheep in the wilderness. They are precious to him. But he said, I'm going to leave you for some time. And I am going to search for the sheep that was lost. That is the good shepherd. How much time shall I seek? Until I find it. Until I find. He searched us, let me say, 33 and a half years upon this earth. And finally, on the cross of Calvary, that is the place he found me. He did not find me before that. And on the sacrifice, through his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, he found me until he finds you. Dear brothers and sisters, each one of us are saved because he pursued in seeking you, in loving you, in searching you until he found you. And that until was the cross of Calvary, that terrible death the bleeding and the agony and the sorrow. That is where he found us. That is the good shepherd. He gives his life. But there, there are several truths, but I just want to highlight only one or two here. That is, when we think about the death of Christ, or especially in this passage about the good shepherd, there are three things that stand out. It was voluntary. Yeah, look at uh, uh, verse uh, 17. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life for the sheep. Nobody's compelling me. You know, I lay down. Look at verse 11. The good shepherd gives his life. Again, laying down. That idea is repeated three times. Verse 11 Verse 17, okay? And then verse 18, uh, second part, I have power to lay it down. It was a voluntary death. It was voluntary. Many a times we do sacrificial things because it is forced upon us. Somebody is twisting our arms to do it. That is why we do it. But this was voluntary, out of love, out of grace, out of his compassion and mercy, seeking love, searching love, giving love, dying love, love pouring out, agape love. Before the New Testament was written, the world, the Greek literature also had no concept of agape love. And that is so special to New Testament documents. Agape love, the love that we find through the life and death of Jesus Christ. And voluntary, it was also vicarious, substitutionary atonement, as theologians would put it. Vicarious, he died in our place. The Lord said, 
I give my life for the sheep. That preposition for in the Greek New Testament brings out the tremendous concept of dying in my place, in our place, on our behalf. Not just for our benefit, but in our place. Liberal theologians and worldly philosophers, they would say the death of Christ was exemplary. It was sacrificial. It was the death of a martyr. No, 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 no. None of these things. It was a vicarious death. That is why we are saved. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. He died for me. There was nobody else to die for me for my sin. Who shall pay my debt? He said, I will pay it. He stood in my place. It was voluntary. It was vicarious. It was also victorious. Because, what did he say in verse 18? No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Prophesying his own resurrection. That's why I said, good shepherd is a dying shepherd. But that death, death was voluntary, vicarious, and victorious. It was not accidental. Alexander the Great, he died at the age of 32 or 33. Accidental. John Keats, you know, that young poet in the prime of his youth, he died. Accidental death. Our great president, John F. Kennedy, tragic, terrible, accidental death. Concerning the death of many of our own dear ones, we may qualify it as accidental, but not this death. It was willing, it was calculated, it was voluntary, it was vicarious. It was not for him, it was for the world, for me and you, and it was victorious death. We praise the Lord for this morning. We know some of our dear ones who used to attend this conference with us, they are not with us this year. They have gone to the other side of glory. But what a wonderful thought. The death is a victorious death of our Lord that will open the gate of resurrection it for us also in the future. We will be resurrected one day after we die, after we are gone, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. We will, he will, we will be resurrected with him. A victorious death. As I was contemplating this, you know, I, I, I remembered a statement uh, my father told me personally many years ago in relation to worship. See, many of these things come back to me by way of my, for my own encouragement. You know, this was his statement that the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. And primarily his death and followed by his resurrection. Then he said, have you ever thought that anybody asking you to remember their death? You know, it's not a pleasant thing to ask, remember somebody's death. That is why even for a memorial service, we don't say anything about death. We celebrate their life. That is one way of getting over psychologically our grief. That's okay. That's good. There's nothing wrong. But the Lord did not say, you come together around my table and celebrate my life. No. What did he say? Remember me, my death. This is the body broken for you. So he said, don't you think that it is a, it is a, a wonderful truth? Because that death is so special. Nobody can die that death. Vicarious, voluntary, and victorious. It was a substitution. You know, the New Testament writers struggled with the Greek vocabulary to express the tremendous meaning of the death of Christ. Through this expression for, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were at sinners, Christ 
died for us. Substitution. Then Paul, in his epistles, brought that other wonderful, beautiful theological word, reconciliation. Then John and P Paul, I don't know whether they consulted each other, they said, let us bring another heavy word, which down through the centuries, Christians won't be able to even pronounce. Propitiation. You know, appeasing the wrath of God, placating the wrath of God through the death of Christ. The death of Christ was a reconciliatory death. Then Paul said, let me use another rich language from my vocabulary. It was a redemptive death. It was a substitutionary death. It was a reconciliatory death. It was a propitiatory death. It was a, re it was a redemptive death. The good shepherd dying is not just dying. It is the death is pregnant with meaning related to your salvation. And my salvation, what a wonderful thought, victorious. In this chapter, we also know that the good shepherd knows his sheep. The sheep hear his voice and follow him. What a wonderful truth. Let me move to the next thought, that is the great shepherd. That is even, you know, a simpler thought, but a very profound thought. Psalm 23 beautifully describes, and in my outline notes I have made, you know, an outline of Psalm 23 as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ as the great shepherd. Let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21 were the writer to the Hebrews, whether it is Paul or someone else. Hebrews 13, verse 20. This is a prayer, a benediction, and a doxology together. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. Complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The great shepherd, the God of peace, who brought up the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his death, he is the good shepherd. But in his resurrection, he is the great shepherd. In his resurrection, followed by his ascension, glorification, and exaltation. And today, he is living as our great shepherd, leading and guiding and providing and protecting for us. And the writer to the Hebrews tells us that he is the high priest of his people. In the heavenly sanctuary, mediating, representing, and interceding. The ministry of mediation, the ministry of representation, and the ministry of intercession carried out by this great high priest. So when we think of him as our great high, great high priest, it reminds us about Jesus Christ being our great shepherd. As a chief shepherd, as the, uh, as the good shepherd, he died and saved me. But as the good shepherd, he is taking care of me today. Let me draw your attention back to Luke 15. What did the good shepherd, what did he do? He sought the sheep until he found it. Pardon me again, I am adding my dad's commentary on it. The good shepherd found the sheep. And after that, the great shepherd took it on his shoulders until he reached home. One time I heard my dad saying, for the last 50 years, I have been traveling 
on his shoulders. What a noble thought is that. For the last 50 years, I have been traveling on his shoulders. And I know I am traveling on his shoulders. Brothers and sisters, take courage. You are traveling on his shoulders. I have a granddaughter now. You know, and when she walks around, everybody would say, let her play around. But what do I want to do? I want to take her. I want to take her. That is how we express our love, our intimacy, our appreciation. That's something which we cannot de describe. You know, that is what the good shepherd, the great shepherd is doing. Are you burdened this morning? Are you weighed down by your sickness, by problem, by separation, anything spoken or unspoken need? I don't have much counsel, counsel to give you, but the most important counsel as a Christian, as your fellow brother in Jesus Christ, as a Christian counselor, I can tell you, the word of God reminds us this morning in all its authority that the Lord Jesus Christ has found us as the good shepherd and as the great shepherd he is carrying us home and he will not put us down until we reach home our salvation is secure security of salvation forget it you know you don't have to worry about it until you reach home until you reach home he, you are carried. The ministry of intercession, mediation, as our high priest and as our head. In our sanctification, in our weakness. Hebrews 7.25, he is able to save anyone who draws near to him. To save them to the uttermost. That KJV translation is really what shall I say, cool? Is that the right word for it? It's really cool, you know? To the uttermost. That means you can't, the word denotes perfection and completion. It is talking, not talking about the salvation of a sinner. It is the perfection of a saint. In my needs, in my weakness. You know, he is living as my high priest, as the head of the church, with all authority in heaven and on earth. As the great shepherd, leading, providing, protecting, watching over, and then able to save me to the uttermost. You know, there is nothing beyond that. To the greatest degree of perfection and completion and maturity, he is able to do it if you allow him to do that. The writer to the Hebrews was fascinated with that idea. And he devoted bulk of his epistle in his brilliant vocabulary and language to describe about the glories of this high priest and contrasted him with the priests of Israel. And he said, look at this priest, a new priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. What a wonderful Lord Jesus Christ we have this morning. A great savior. And let me close with this. He is also our chief shepherd. Probably we read that verse a number of times during this week. First Peter, that was the theme of our meditation in a number of sessions. First Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter 5 verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears... You will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. This is talking about his return for his people. See, as the good shepherd, he is the only one. There is none like him. He is all alone in the work of his atonement. In his high priestly ministry, he is all alone. There is none like him. He doesn't need anybody's help. But when you say chief, he is chief among someone. 
Am I right? Am I making any interpretive blunders here? I hope not. When the word chief comes, that means he's chief among somebody. Fairest of all the earth beside, and chiefest of all unto thy bride. Among his people, among kings, and among lords, and among the nations, he is chief. On the cross, as a good shepherd, he's all alone. And as the great shepherd, he is all alone. But he is chief among others, among his people, in the midst of his church, and among the nations, among the people, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Because when he comes, the whole world will bow down before him, every knee will confess, every knee will bow down, every tongue will confess, and he alone will stand as the chief, the chief shepherd. How carefully the Spirit of God has recorded these offices, the threefold offices of prophet, priest, and king, corresponds to good shepherd, great shepherd, and uh, chief shepherd. And how carefully those words were chosen to denote profound doctrinal truths. You know, just uh, one more thought as I close. He is great in his, he is good in his dying. He is great in his rising. And he is chief in his ruling, in his authority. Let us see him in all his glory this morning. Lord Jesus, you are good in your dying. That is why I'm saved. You are great in your resurrection. That is why you are leading me as the resurrected victorious Lord. My victorious Lord. Captain of our salvation. But you will be chief in your coming. He is good to me as a sinner. He is great to me as a saint, and he will be chief to me as my king and as my ruler in his kingdom. As a sinner, I look to him for salvation, and as a saint, I bring all my petitions to him, all my struggles to the great shepherd, and he gives me his resurrection life and leads me victoriously. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 9 brings a parallel to these truths when he talks about the three appearing appearances of Christ. As the good shepherd, he appeared in the fullness of time. And today, the writer to the Hebrews tells, he is appearing for us in the presence of God as our high priest, and one day, future tense, he will appear. He has appeared, he is appearing, and he will appear. Good shepherd, that is the atonement. Great shepherd, that is the ministry of advocacy. The chief shepherd, that is related to his second advent. Good shepherd justified me. Great shepherd is sanctifying me. The chief shepherd is coming to glorify me. What a wonderful truth about our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, that is our hope. That is our hope. In our notes, I have a description of the various, given the description of the various aspects of our hope. Blessed hope, a hope that is an anger of the soul, a hope that does not disappoint us, a living hope. Paul said, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I die, I'm sure I will rise again because of his resurrection victory. He will rapture me on that morning of the rapture we will all be joined together with the saints of the ages. 
and then we will see him as our chief shepherd and he will give the crowns of life for our faithful faithful service for him we will share in his glory and we will share in his reign comfort of all my earthly way jesus i'll meet thee some sweet day sender of glory thee i will see wonderful man of calvary let our worship not stop i wanted our worship to continue even through my ministry and i want our worship to continue as we eat as we travel as we continue to serve the great and good and chief shepherd don't stop worshiping him he alone is worthy and one day we will see him and we all will be united with him forever the sheep in the house of the shepherd never more to part again looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our lord jesus christ in that great hope and courage knowing that the great shepherd is living for us let us go back to our respective places love him and serve him and commit our lives to the glory of god and for his service